Uh, thank you, Ian, very much for uh, the introduction, much undeserved. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of you uh, very much for coming out this afternoon. Uh, I understand that they're sort of squeezing you with respect to classes, and I'll try not to interfere with you going off to other classes. Or you could do what I always did, which was skip classes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when, they, when they first called me, or wrote to me, and they said, would you please come and speak as a distinguished speaker, and give a lecture about whatever you want, but mostly criminal law, uh, I initially balked. I wasn't sure I was going to come, and that's because I have a confession to make. I'm a terrible lecturer. I, um, I, I can speak in public, I can advocate a position, I can do trials, but when I come to speak to groups, I don't have any particular message for you. I, I'm more of a storyteller, and I'm a real trial lawyer. That's how I've spent my whole life. So in, th in trying to figure out what to say to you this morning that would be of interest, uh, and I'm assuming most, if not all of you, are, are lawyers or want to be lawyers, and, um, and that you intend to practice, not necessarily as criminal lawyers, but nonetheless practice. Um, I originally was going to <coughs> uh, give you 10 lessons on, uh, uh, on what is required to be a criminal lawyer and punctuate each one with a story from some case. Um, but uh, I spent, unfortunately, about a half an hour speaking to Ian, who tells me that um, the real interest uh, is because I was counsel for Paul Bernardo. So let me um, switch gears, put, a, put aside my notes. I only have about 45 or 50 minutes, and let me focus your attention in on this particular case. Because it, it, although it happened so long ago, some of you may have not even been born, um, it still kind of haunts the profession uh, today. And the reason is that it was a difficult case that was rife with um, ethical, uh, legal, and professional obligations and issues. And um, I don't know, I <laughs> apparently I get credit for navigating my way through it. I don't know why, because at that point in my life I was 25 years at the bar and um, just doing what I do every day, which is go out and defend people. I've never been a prosecutor, so I just did what I always did and uh, just defended the case. But, I, but there's, it's a little bit more complex than that. So the first thing is, how many of you <clears throat> were born <laughs> um, after 1993? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you see what I mean about, about age? And, and let me tell you something else. I went to law school you'll love this, between 1965 and 1968. Now just think about that. That's a hundred years after the Civil War, <laughs> after Confederation, and 50 years next year well, from the, uh, on the date I graduated. That's like, that's like um, the people who are involved in the First World War talking to a Civil War veteran. Right? And yet, although I'm sort of closer to the end than the beginning, I want you to understand that in this profession, time means nothing. It's a continuum. We're just all passing through. And although I'm in my 70s, deep down inside here is a 25-year-old trying to get out <laughs> and still full of, I, I won't use the vernacular, the energy I hope the interest, the uh, desire uh, to continue to be a courtroom lawyer. The same way I was when I was sitting in those seats at a different school, but at, in those similar seats, and I always wanted to get out and do this for a living. Money, was, unfortunately for my family, was not the prime motivator. So, 
So when we talk, when I say to you, well, who was born in 19, after 1993, and most of you put your hand up, that means that you have no idea what the, what the Bernardo and Homolka case was about. So let me just give you a snapshot. Paul Bernardo and his wife, Har Carla Homolka, will forever be known for the murders and the other crimes they committed in southern Ontario in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Paul Bernardo, as it turned out, was the Scarborough rapist. He was running around Scarborough raping young ladies uh, who were usually on their way home uh, at night from a bus stop, usually going to their, where they lived. And it was a stranger rape and it was driving the police crazy. And he met Carla Hamalka uh, when he was an accounting student in his 20s, uh, working for one of the big five accounting firms. Um, and she was a 17-year-old assistant at a, um, uh, a pet food, uh, pet, pet food, pet grooming shop in St. Catharines. And she had come to Toronto. They had met accidentally, and it was lust at first sight. And, and sex was what was driving their relationship. Now, have you ever read Truman Capote in, um, in Cold Blood? Yeah, there you go. And uh, I, I recommend it to everybody. It's what they call a true crime novel. And, and what comes out of that novel, and that I have found to be true in all of these sorts of cases, the, the Australians refer to them as Jack and Jill murders, but w what, what comes out is that in these kinds of cases, neither of the players would commit the crimes, the, the murders that were ultimately committed alone. But for some reason, and it may be the human, the, the humankind, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but sometimes when two people meet, it doesn't necessarily have to be a man and a woman. Many times it's two men who meet in jail often or on the street or two women who, like, um, oh, I forgot the name of the movie, but, you know, uh, and, and they, they form an entity that is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And together, together they possess the energy and the, the chutzpah, really, they, uh, to go out and do these horrible, horrible things. And that's what happened here, because, um, because they got together he dropped out of his accounting. Uh, he went to live in St. Catharines with uh, Carla's uh, parents and her two sisters. Um, they used to, uh, virginity was a huge issue with him. Uh, Carla was not, uh, so she offered up her baby sister. Uh, they got her drunk, uh, so they, they drugged her one night. Uh, and when everybody else was sleeping, he had sex with her and got her virginity as a surrogate to, uh, to Carla. And later on, um, they, they adjourned near the Christmas holidays when poor Tammy Homolka was uh, obtunded from drink and uh, eventually uh, given a, um, an animal anesthetic, put to sleep, uh, sexually assaulted on video and by both of them. And when she woke up, you know when you go in for an operation, they make sure you don't eat and drink for 24 hours? This poor girl had had booze, food, all those drugs. And she, when she was waking up, she became nauseous, she vomited, she aspirated her stomach contents into her lungs, and she died. They hid it, they covered it up, they called 911, and the police treated it as an accident. And as Carla later said, that's when she knew she was doomed. I don't believe it, but because she was a willing participant, but nonetheless, they were now inextricably linked. And what they used to do is drive around St. Catharines and the surrounding area, uh, looking for young girls, peeping into windows, videotaping people getting undressed, and eventually um, looking for uh, another victim. And in fact, there were some. There was a coworker, a young girl in her early teens who Carla brought home for dinner one night. They drugged her, they had sex with her. That was Jane Doe, uh, there were some others. And one night, Paul was out stealing license plates because he was smuggling across the border. And he, um, 
uh, it was in Burlington, and uh, um, Leslie Mahaffey was late, she missed her curfew, and he came upon her sitting on the picnic bench in the backyard of her home, and he essentially kidnapped her. He wrapped her head in a, in a coat so she couldn't see him, pushed her into the car, and Leslie was a street kid and very uh, resilient and, uh, much, and very courageous. Uh, and she kind of went with the play. And um, uh, they spent the weekend uh, having sex with her, although she was blindfolded. And it was all videotaped. And, um, uh, and then there was a big debate about whether to let her go or not. And the, uh, Paul said it was Carla's decision. She said it was his. But a decision was made where she was killed. Was she strangled? Was she hit on the head? Those were all issues at trial. And she was dismembered. She was scoured for trace evidence, dismembered, and dumped into the uh, water reservoir for St. Catharines. So if you come from St. Catharines, I pity you. But anyways, um, <laughs> and, and the reservoir, uh, as reservoirs tend to do, they go up and down when they came down. Uh, the body parts were encased sort of in cement and they became exposed and the police realized that they had a problem. They started an investigation. They had no idea who this was. It took months to even identify her. And by that time, um, they didn't know how this had all happened and they were, they were at a loss. Toronto, in the meantime, had taken this DNA sample as in a Ramden way, but the DNA sample was sitting on a shelf at the Center of Forensic Sciences for three years. Anyways, um, so things were not working that well. And uh, on the Thursday of the Easter weekend, they um, were driving through St. Catharines and they came upon uh, poor Kristen French, uh, who was just minding her own business, walking home from school, about 14 years old. They stopped, uh, Carla asked her for directions um, and while she was sort of showing the directions on the map, Paul pushed her into the car, they, uh, they subdu subdued her, they drove her back to their home uh, in Port de Luzi, which is a suburb of St. Catharines, and they did exactly the same thing, only she was not blindfolded. <clears throat> and, um, and she was eventually killed, and instead of dismembering her, they scoured her body for trace evidence, and Paul drove her back to um, Burlington and dumped her on the side of a road um, near the Mahaffey home and down the, the road from the, the, the cemetery where uh, Leslie Mahaffey was buried, which uh, uh, apparently, according to psychologists, not unusual in these kinds of things, um, rather interesting. But <clears throat> having said all that, and the reason I give you the preamble is because you have to understand the nature of the case and the fact that these tapes were in the middle. Now, why is it so, such an interesting thing for lawyers? And, and what happened in that case that we're still talking about it? So, Bernardo and Homolka lived in St. Catharines. The police found the body. They're, they're at a loss. Toronto is now waking up. It might be him. They're kind of circling, circling. And around that time, they have an argument, Paul and Carla, and uh, she claims that he punched her in the nose and she's got the raccoon eyes and, and it was uh, in the newspapers and so forth. But the point is that they were separated. And the police did what they always do when they have a, a person of interest or a prime suspect, is they, they, they go around wide and they come narrow and narrow and narrow and they eventually hit the target. So going wide, they see the estranged wife, they figure they may as well yank her chain and see what she can tell them about him not knowing that she was in fact implicated. And uh, Carla, uh, who is not dumb, quite actually quite bright, um, lawyered up. Wouldn't talk to them until she got a lawyer. Went in and spoke to a lawyer, a classmate of mine by the name of George Walker, who practiced in Niagara Falls. She must have told him, I don't know, she must have told him what happened and about the tapes. He walked into the Crown's office in St. Catharines and said, what if, in a hypothetical way, and that's how the deal was made. And uh, they did, a, 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 without prejudice or what we call a queen for a day interview, they liked what they heard. Uh, then they did a more formal KGB interview and when they had her down, and she told them about the tapes, 
they went out and arrested him. Without her, one of the officers later testified at an inquiry, without her, they had no evidence against either of them. So she became the prime crown witness. The police go and they try to look for the tapes and they cannot find them. And the warrant expires. And this is where the ethical issues arise. Mr. Murray, in the gap between the two uh, search warrants, gets instructions from the client to go into the house and retrieve the tapes. Not a good thing for lawyers to do because it put, makes you a witness, it gets you involved in the investigation, you, you lose your independence, it compromises your position as counsel, but he did it anyways. And he went in and he, in order for, to get the tapes, he had to stand on the bathroom uh, uh, vanity and take down the, the light fixture and stick his hand up into the attic and all the way along and he pulled out these little mini cassettes that they used to have in, before we had digital and um, he got them. And it's what he did or didn't do that is the whole thing that you have been discussing, no doubt, in your ethics and evidence classes. But I thought maybe you might like to hear from the person who actually <laughs> touched them <laughs> and had to deal with them. So I was not the first lawyer, Mr. Murray was. And, uh, and the case was sort of percolating along and Carla had made her deal. They got a publication ban and that, that drove the, the press wild. So it became a very, very high media case in the extreme. And Mr. Murray just didn't know what to do with the tapes. And for 16 months, he sat on them. And one day he phones me, I, I knew him and it's a long story, but he phones me and he says, have I got a case for you? Not words to that effect. He said, would you like to take over this case? I said, why, you know, like you're doing it. It's just another legal aid murder case, right? Um, I've got 25 in the drawer. I mean, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? So. He came in and, and we talked about it and I talked to my partner and I talked to my family and, and I said, no, I'm not gonna do it. I'm too busy. And he got his then junior, Carolyn McDonald, who was in California with my junior, they were living together at the time, and she gets on the phone and tells me he is screwing up, he doesn't know what to do. If you take over the file, I'll come and help you. That never happened for a variety of reasons, but. Nonetheless, what was also happening and what you have to understand in order to understand the, the ethical implications is that at a, exactly the same time, O.J. Simpson was before the courts in California. As a matter of fact, my wife and I had gone for, on a holiday to uh, the Caribbean in the summer when the preliminary hearing was on and after the third day of screaming at the television, my wife, uh, uh, me screaming at the television, my wife, we came back from the beach and the television was gone. She had ordered them to take the televisions out of the room so I wouldn't <laughs> scream at uh, what was going on in California because I was so frustrated. And, but you remember in O.J. Simpson that the knife appeared, it went into a bag and they handed it up to Judge Ito, who was the judge, I, I think the trial judge. And, uh, and then there was a whole thing about whether they would open it or, or whatever. So, so I think to myself, okay, 25 years of doing this, what's it all been for? If somebody like this, the worst case, the worst offender, the highest publicity, you know, Mr. Altruistic comes forward and says, okay, okay, I'll do this because I don't want our system taking a black eye like they were ha was happening in the States. Anyway, so I say, okay, on three conditions. The client has to agree, ethical issue number one, because he's dumping the case. Legal aid has to agree, it's a money issue. And the Chief Justice has to agree to give me a long adjournment because the trial was supposed to start about a month after I was first approached. And nothing had been done and this case was not ready to go to trial. So we went and saw the client. And when we went to see the client, Mr. Murray went in ahead of me to break the news 
And I later found out, tell him to keep his mouth shut about the tapes and not tell me. He didn't tell me, the client didn't tell me. And then after um, I, came, I went in and I saw him and everything was great, um, then legal aid went, oh, thank God. And um, because I'm a pretty efficient lawyer. And then uh, we went and saw the Chief Justice. And we saw him in chambers with the prosecutors. And it was Chief Justice Lesage, and he said, I'm not doing this in chambers. I want a formal application. I want in public to know why you're getting off the case. And I said, and as far as the adjournment goes, I'm not committing myself. I said, good, I'm not on the record. Thank you, I'm leaving. Uh, you know, it's easier said than done. <laughs> but what happened was that um, Mr. Murray, I guess, got nervous went and retained the late Austin Cooper, who was at that time the Dean of the Bar. And Mr. Cooper went to the Law Society, and he must have told him about the tapes. He went to the Law Society, and he uh, got an opinion from an ad hoc committee on what to do. And the opinion it was in writing, and it said, put the tapes in an envelope and hand them up to the trial judge, just like O.J. Simpson. Anyways, they served it on Bernardo, and it happened on that day. I had called Dan to find out if he had heard anything, and he was busy with Mr. Murray and his lawyer, now Justice Peter West, who was with Austin Cooper. And he said to me later when he called me back, he said, look, you better get down here. I, there's something happened. So I went down. I saw what happened. I had him handwrite a direction to fire Murray so that he wouldn't be able to to say anything in court on the 12th of September when we were supposed to go. And the reason I did that was because that letter protected the lawyer. It didn't protect the client. It was what the lawyer could do to get off the record, not the lawyer's obligation to the client. And I was angry. So I uh, decided to go to court on the 12th of September of that year, and I did. And at that time, Mr. Murray and his lawyer appeared, and Mr. Cooper handed up the tapes. I tried to stop them, but they handed up the package. And the package um, of these mini cassettes, uh, it was sealed, and Justice Lesage read the letter, and he said, Mr. Cooper, we're not in Southern California. I'm not Judge Ito, and I don't accept exhibits, except the clerk takes the exhibits, and we're not in a trial. And so they went back to Mr. Murray. So what do you do? So we called a timeout. We, had a, we went and met in chambers. We came to an agreement. We told the Crown, who didn't know what was in the package, but they suspected. Um, and they, um, uh, they agreed that on my personal undertaking, to deal legally, ethically, and professionally with the contents of the package, they would agree that Mr. Murray could withdraw without comment or affidavit or anything. And, uh, and then we'll see what happens. But I was not officially on the record. So we go back into chambers, and this is the next ethical issue. I get the package. I bring Clay Ruby with me. Uh, to sort of uh, balance Austin, they're both benchers at the time, and, and also I don't want to be a witness, right? So we go in there, Clay gets the package, he opens it up, out come the six or eight mini cassettes with hearts and flowers, Carlos handwriting, you know, Paul, Leslie, and me, you know, all this nonsense, like real evidence right on the cassette tape, never mind what's on the tape themselves. I say, <clears throat> where are the copies? the VHS copies, because I know from Mr. Murray's former staff that he rented a special machine to convert the little mini cassettes into VHS format so he could play the VHS format without uh, altering the originals. Mr. Cooper said, there are no copies. I said, no, I, I think there are. He said, I'm telling you, there are no copies. One of the young ladies that used to work for Mr. Murray, who was in the room, said, uh, oh, yes, there are copies. To which he said, they're at my farm. 
Now, I've never seen Austin Cooper angry. He wasn't the type to go off like a volcano. Instead, he imploded, imploded. You go with Mr. West, you get them, you deliver them to Mr. Rosen. No, nope, not me, Mr. Ruby. And I don't care, whatever. And that's what happened. And Clay and I sat down and we watched these videos. And I didn't know who was there, I didn't know what was going on, but I had to excuse myself and go in the bathroom and have a good cry because I saw, uh, I foresaw a trial in which these tapes, I knew in my heart they were going to wind up with the prosecution, would be played and the jury would come over the boards, not at the client, but at me because I had the audacity to represent him. That's what went through my mind. And I also thought about my wife and I thought about my kids and and the whole bit. And then I did what I always do. I sort of, <laughs> I don't know how you explain it, but you kind of like, you know, it's almost like athletics, right? You just say, all right, <clears throat> screw this. <laughs> You're in this now. And that's what you got to be able to do. You have to, if you're going to be a trial lawyer, you need to find the, in, the what they call intestinal fortitude, the guts, the, in, the inner strength, the spirit. Not to judge your client. Not to be intimidated by the nature of the case. Not to worry about what other people are going to think or say about you. Because at the end of the day in that courtroom, there's only one person that that client is clinging to to make sure that he or she gets a fair trial. That's your obligation. And to protect their interests. And that's you if you decide to be a defense counsel. And a lot of people don't have the stomach for it. Some people go into this thinking it's a profession to make money and they, they run clients through their offices like sausages. Don't do that. It's demeaning. It, 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 it erodes your own self-confidence and your own self-worth and eventually you'll just fizzle and go away and sell Xerox machines or something. Okay, don't do it or get disbarred. If you're gonna do this, do it right. Do it for real and do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's what it takes. And that's what we did. We sat down and we said, okay, how do you create what do you, first of all, what do we do with his tapes? And we did the research and, and I went and I spoke to the client and I got his written um, instructions authorizing me to give the tapes over. And even if he hadn't given me those instructions, I would have done it anyways because I, I was obliged to under the common law. Because they were evidence of the crime and the instrumentality of the crime and that's why they went over. I had him sign the directions so that we could preserve the lawyer-client relationship. Believe me, I could have used it as a springboard to get the hell out of that case. To, to, to say, I'm sorry, I'm a potential witness, I can no longer act. That would have been the coward's way out. I'm not a coward. And so I went and I did this trial. And you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> and I'm going to read you something. <clears throat> And I wrote this a while ago. Like the O.J. Simpson prosecution, the Bernardo trial was covered daily in the media across Canada and internationally. Since our laws prohibit cameras in the courtroom, the media reports were comprehensive and were supported with photographs and video footage of me and my team walking to and from the Toronto courthouse because it got transferred from St. Catharines to Toronto every single day. I used to say to them, like, why are you taking my picture again? I'm not talking to you, I'm just walking into the courthouse. Uh, the editor needs something fresh every day. Okay, fine. The byproduct of this exposure was that people started to recognize me on site. And uh, now I understand what celebrities go through and why they, they are concerned about their, their, not only their privacy, but their protection. Complete strangers stopped me on the street to say hello and to shake my hand. 
And I'll tell you the first time it happened, I was walking down the street in the middle of the trial in downtown Toronto and this guy comes over and he says, are, are, you, that, are you that Rosen guy, you know, representing the Bernardo? And you know, I'm like, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and he, oh, I just want to shake your hand. You're doing a hell of a good job. I don't agree with your client, but you're doing a great job. Okay, and, that's, and that was what I got. People came over, they shook my hand, no one ever uttered an unkind word. And I think, at the end of the day, it was their way of thanking me for my efforts, or actually more broadly speaking, for validating and recognizing the role of the, my role as a defense counsel in the criminal justice system that, uh, that all Canadians actually value. And th this is a system that you, when you get out of here and you article and you do whatever you have to do to get called to the bar, that you are going to be part of. And, and remember that because you speak for all of us in Canada when you come out as lawyers. And I think that they recognized, they, maybe they couldn't articulate it, but they recognized that we all have a stake in ensuring a fair trial and a just outcome for everyone, no matter who they are, no matter how bad the case. And that is the, the goal. Do I like to win? I love to win. But that isn't the only thing that defense counsel do. Wins are relative. There's gray areas. A manslaughter instead of a murder is a win. Right? An outright acquittal is a win. An assault instead of a sexual assault is a win, may be a win, right? Uh, a theft instead of a robbery may be a win. Or you lose and the client goes out the back door and the first time it happened to me, I wanted to throw up my, sh my cookies. But because, uh, like, I was responsible, I felt responsible, even though, you know, the judge made the decision. But at the end of the Bernardo trial, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this to your attention is this. I want you to picture this. We have this trial that starts on May the 1st of 1995, and it ends on September the 1st of 1995 with a week off for the jury to have a holiday. So we're every single day. And I get up at 5.30, I go to the gym, I do a workout, I go to the courthouse, I go in, we were in court all day, we go out and get a bite to eat, my team and I, we come back to the courthouse, we work till 12, 1, 2 in the morning, getting ready for the next day, and we do that, and on the weekends it's the same routine except we didn't go to court. So it's seven days a week for all that, that time. And we're in the, the room and the jury who's out overnight, thinking about their verdict, come back and they convict him of everything. And there's, you know, the pandemonium in the courtroom, people are shuffling around, and I'm standing with my client, who's right behind me in the box, and the jury has just announced their verdict. And he says to me, well, John, at least I got a fair trial. To me, the biggest compliment in the world, even though he lost. As a defense counsel, I did my job. And I hope, mem uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was going to say members of the jury. <laughs> I, 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 I hope sincerely that y you think about what I've said today. You think about what you're learning. You think about, kind of project what it's going to be like out there. Be true to your principles. Act with integrity, act with professionalism, and you will have a wonderful career, trust me. Thank you, those are my comments. <laughs>